Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video, I will share my best tips on how you can get the most out of AI for mobile development. In case you don't know me, I'm Philip, and since 2019, I'm doing nothing else than developing software with Kotlin. So if you want to learn more about developing for the full software stack with Kotlin with more than 1000 videos, then definitely subscribe to this channel to not miss any upcoming videos. AI for mobile development. For a very long time, I've actually worked with web-based AI tools. So most prominently, of course, ChatGPT, but also for quite some time with Claude, especially for coding related questions, Claude is very good. And that was already a very big game changer. But the problem of these purely web-based tools like ChatGPT, Claude, all these websites where you just put in your prompt has always been the context. So what these tools know about your project, because by default, they don't know anything about your project. If you have a question, if you want them to fix something for you, then you have to phrase a prompt, give them all your context, paste all your files that may be relevant for that prompt, and then read and interpret their answer in order to maybe paste some parts back into your project. And sometimes you just have to provide so much context for them that it exceeds the so-called context window. So how much characters in the end you can really fit into one prompt, how much characters an AI can process per prompt. And this is how we come to this video sponsor who is none other than JetBrains. Because in the recent months, I've personally heavily worked with their AI agent called Juni, which is directly built here into our IDE, into Android Studio, but of course also worked with their other IDEs like IntelliJ. And starting to use that AI agent really helped me to become more productive compared to just using these web-based AI tools. And I've really used other AI agents as well, like Claude Code, for example, which is also technically being built in your IDE, but it, for example, only works via a terminal. And while using a terminal is not a big problem for a developer, it still felt like to me that it made it harder to write some prompts because it's a, in a terminal, it's not that nice to write some, some longer prompts and also not that nice to process longer answers from an AI. And while with Juni, the pure output quality is comparable with a tool like Claude Code, I definitely found it much, much nicer to work with because it's directly built into the IDEs that also come from the same company as this AI tool. And in my opinion, it just has a nicer overall interface for us to work with. But one step at a time, what actually is an AI agent? An AI agent in the end takes this typical web interface where you simply ask something to the AI and then get some kind of answer you have to interpret, you have to then use for yourself. It takes that to the next level by actually being able to do something for you. So on the one hand, you can of course also just ask certain questions to such an AI agent, but you can also delegate real tasks to it. So it can really take over parts of your development. And the big game changer here is that Juni really finds the context it needs on its own. So while just feeding your entire code base into one single prompt, no AI would support that at this point because it would just be too much code for a medium to large scale project. The approach that Juni has is it processes your prompt and translates that into clear terminal instructions that help Juni to find just the context, just the files that it needs in order to process your prompt and give you a good answer. And what I also like about Juni specifically compared to other AI agents that I've tried is JetBrain's overall philosophy behind it. You really feel like that is not just another tool that targets people who want to vibe code the next Facebook without knowing anything about coding. But it is a tool that is made for professionals who just want to become more productive when doing their work. And that's exactly what I want to do. So let's now talk about how you really get the most out of such an AI agent or AI in general as a mobile developer, because I see there are two main use cases. On the one hand, use case learning, you want to learn certain new concepts with the help of AI. And use case two is coding. So you really want to use AI to become more productive and build certain things faster. Because there are really a few very nice tricks that I can share here, how you get the most out of such AI prompts. Starting with use case one about learning. I'm here actually in my uh, CMP Bookpedia project, which is the Compose Multi-Platform Crash Course app that I have built here on YouTube. It's a five and a half hour video, big recommendation here if you want to learn Compose Multi-Platform. But I really just want to use this project as an example to showcase how I would now use an AI to really learn something. So you can see this is our project structure here. We have one Compose app module with uh, our typical Kotlin Multi-Platform structure. We have an Android target desktop and iOS, and of course the shared code. And in here we have just a bunch of different classes. We have a, a book feature, we have a core layer that includes a shared code that could possibly be shared between features, data domain presentation architecture, and in there you can, you can guess it. It's in the end a book app that talks to a book API, loads book data, and then has a list and a detail screen. And let's say you're now working on such a project here, be it a Compose multi-platform one, be it an Android one, any 
any sort of coding project, then what I would really always do is to ask every little bit about your code that you are unsure about. I really still have the feeling that people are still afraid to ask certain things, even if they are talking to an AI. So for example, if you are currently getting into multi-module architecture in mobile development, so whether it may make sense to actually apply a multi-module architecture here in this project, which currently uses just a single module. Then if this would be a question that I had, I would go over here to Juni, which is really just an extra tab in your IDE. And you can install Juni, by the way, by just opening your settings, going to plugins, marketplace, and then searching for Juni, and then, ah, Juni. And then you will find here JetBrains Juni, install this, probably relaunch your IDE, and then you will see this here as an extra tab in your IDE. And you can see this is a much nicer interface to work with than in a terminal. But here we in the end have our text tab where we can just put in any type of prompt we want to ask the AI. You can also actually uh, choose the model that you want to use for this AI. Uh, GPT-5 just came out, so if you want to use that, Juni already supports it. That's something you can also change in the settings by searching for Juni here under models. You can see I've set this to GPT-5 but you can also use Claude models. But in the end here in this tool, we also see our two use cases, either coding or asking. In this case, let's start with asking because we want to learn something. We want to learn whether, for example, a multi-module architecture makes sense in this project. So this would be a question you had. You would type this in here. For example, would it make sense to migrate this project to use a multi-module architecture? Multi-module architecture. You just send it and you get almost instantly a specific response, you can see it's sending the request to the AI. But the big advantage here of these integrated AI agents is you can see it searches in your project. It has the full context of your project, at least in theory. So it will uh, just search what it thinks it needs for this prompt. It will then use these files, reference these directly for the prompt, and then it will analyze your project structure to find out whether this may make sense for you. And there we go, it gave us an answer where we can click on a view in editor tab. And if we open that, then here we get it as a markdown format, what the answer is from this AI. And it gives us a clear suggestion when multi-module architecture makes sense, consider migrating, if one or more are true. So you're uh, about to add more features. It also suggests some author profiles, collections, reviews, and it even gives us a migration path that we could stick to if we wanted to stick to a multi-module architecture. But here comes the next tip, because AI can obviously be wrong. And even the most up-to-date GPT-5 can be wrong. And if you now ask a Claude model, then it will probably give you a little bit of a different response. So there are actually two tips here in one. Tip number one is, if anything in the response from AI is unclear to you, so if you wouldn't be able to explain this to your grandma, then you don't yet understand enough about this response. So that means you have to ask about these things. So you would at some point be able to explain it to your grandma. Tip number two is, if you are unsure about a certain topic, because of course, if we are learning topics, then we by definition don't have the knowledge that we want to have or that we could have. So we want to know something that the AI knows that we don't, and we are not yet in a position to really validate what the AI gave us. And here a really nice trick is to actually take this response that the AI, that the AI gave you, copy that, and place that in a new tab again. So you go back, you have another tab here and maybe even switch the model. We can also try this here to Sonnet 4. And we say ask and you just say, okay, someone told me this about my code base. Please fact check it. Does all that make sense? Something like that. And you send it because the moment you actually open a new tab here in your AI, it does not have any context about your previous chat history. So it again starts from scratch, possibly with a new model. You can see sometimes it also wants to run certain terminal commands, which you can then do in order to find some uh, files. But this way you actually often find little mistakes of the previous answer or topics where the previous answer was just a bit general about, where you have to be careful about. So does that mean that the second answer is perfect? No, probably not. It's still an answer from an AI after all. But the more you fact check these answers with different AI tabs, I found the more that helps you to really understand which of these answers has which kinds of true elements, because there's often some truth to each answer, but you need a bigger overall picture for yourself to be able to assess which parts of which answer make sense for your project. So while AI1 may give you a tip that AI2 doesn't give you, AI2 may give you another tip that AI1 doesn't give you. And in our case here, it said, okay, the analysis is highly accurate. And we can again view this here in our editor. And in this case, the AI says, hey, that is accurate, that makes sense. 
Whether that is not really the case, that is completely debatable and we could ask professionals, some will disagree, some will agree. But hey, this is something an AI gives you. The moment you ask it, this is an instant response you can get at any time. So we're of course not talking about the same level of quality output than if you were to ask a real professional. But you would need that access to a real professional in order to be able to ask your questions there. And if you don't have that, this is such a nice way to learn coding nowadays, to just be able to ask anything that you have to an AI. That was use case one. Use case two, as I mentioned, is coding, because here in Juni, we also have this code feature. And by the way, we also have a brave mode. Uh, we can also turn this on. This means it will execute terminal commands on its own. Uh, that is, of course, something you have to decide if you want that. Typically, in my experience, it uh, just uses the terminal commands to really uh, find some files in your structure, but then you don't always need to approve these commands. In regards to coding, um, I like to delegate, um, let's say, simple to medium tasks to Juni. For complex tasks, I actually don't like to do that with this um, coding integration here. In that case, I would first of all rather ask Juni or an AI, hey, what would be a suggested strategy to implement this feature just in order to get a first idea of how I could approach such a bigger complex problem and then maybe adjust this a little bit, which of course needs some sort of experience for. But to really delegate bigger tasks and maybe let it build full features to an AI, for that it's really not at the level that I would want yet. So these I'm still writing myself. But the example that we could delegate here to Juni is we will actually take a look in our for example, book detail screen. So this is our screen. And here we also have a preview. So if we build and refresh, then we should see something here, how this actually looks like. There we go. So we have a book detail screen. The book cover here is uh, simply blank because that is loaded from an API normally. Just that you have an idea of how this looks like. And let's say we now want to also have a responsive landscape variant for the screen. That would be a task uh, that I would confidently be, uh, uh, that I would confidently delegate to Juni. It's not too complex, but it still involves some boilerplate code. And for that, I've actually prepared a little prompt that I will simply paste here. Uh, you will get the idea. Create an optimized landscape layout for the book details screen, which shows the book cover on the left and the book details on the right. So a typical uh, two column layout. Reference window size classes for that to find out the screen's dimensions. So window size classes, that is an additional piece of information I gave in here because uh, that is the typical approach, how to handle uh, responsive designs in Compose. So I want it to use that. So let's just click go and wait a little moment. And there we go. After two to three minutes, it actually finished implementing that. You can see it also gives you detailed steps on what it actually did. It first of all took a look if the window size class dependency is actually there. Found out, okay, no, <laughs> it had to add that to Gradle. That is what it did. It extracted some of our structure to know what to put where. And then you can see it makes the first changes. And you can also click on this here in order to get the difference. Uh, and you are, of course, in control of which changes you want to apply from this uh, response. So you get a clear uh, breakdown here of what has been done and you can easily revert this if you don't want to do this by either clicking on rollback all or simply moving or deleting some of these lines that it has added. So down here, you can see lots of changes being made and then it says, okay, it also opened the Compose preview. Um, I didn't see a landscape version in the preview itself, but I would say we just launch the app on my device. And then we test this here on my real device. So there we go. This is our book list screen. And we are now opening the detail screen. There we go. That still looks like before, of course. But if we now rotate our device, then there is our responsive UI. You can see this is scrollable. That is something it thought of. And we get our book cover on the left. So these are just types of tasks that I really much like to delegate to Juni because they are not yet too complex for an AI that it could make really critical mistakes here with this task. But there is still a lot of boilerplate code involved in doing that, in supporting such a landscape layout. And I think at this point, it is pretty clear that AI will be the primary way in future to write code. As much as we developers like to write code ourselves, I think we can't deny that the trend is clearly going in that direction. And that's actually what already happened in the past. So for a long while, we don't have to write any assembly code anymore, but we have high level programming languages like Kotlin, like Python, that allow us to do certain things with much less code. And AI is just now the next level of that, that we can express what we want to do and the AI will then write all the code for us. So the focus of our job shifts from just typing code on our keyboard to solving high level problems. And that is something that I'm convinced will stay for quite a long time. But it is something that you actively have to use. Don't sleep over that change. If you don't use AI to learn new coding concepts nowadays, then you are really going to be left behind. And if you say this is something you want to try out, then of course, in this video's description, you'll find a link to Juni. 
explore it. I really use it almost daily in Android Studio, in IntelliJ, just whenever I have to do anything that involves context of my coding project. And something that is maybe also worth mentioning here is that just this summer, Juni became a GitHub integration as well. So you can really add it to your repository and assign clear issues to it, delegate clear tasks in GitHub to Juni. It will solve these asynchronously, create a pull request for you so you can go over what it suggests to change or to do in order to fix that problem, to solve that issue, to implement that feature. And you can then say, hey, merge, hey, please change that. So you, in the end, stay in control, but you can delegate a lot of your work to an AI. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.